Okay, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Mona Atea. I direct the Institute for Middle East Studies here at the George Washington University. Um, and we're really delighted that you've uh, joined us. I'll be in conversation today with uh, Dr. Sara El Qazaz, who's a senior lecturer or associate professor in comparative politics uh, of the Middle East at SOAS at the University of London. Um, and her research includes um, interests include critical political economy, urbanism in the global south, infrastructure, the politics of science and technology, and ethnography. And we're here to discuss her recently released book, Politics in the Crevices, Urban Design and the Making of Property Markets in Cairo and in Istanbul, which was published by Duke University Press uh, just a couple months ago. Um, her next book project investigates the politics of digital infrastructure by following cloud technologies across the global south with a focus on South Africa and Bahrain. She is co-editor of a special issue on the unexceptional Middle Eastern city and city and society, and she's co-book review editor at the Arab Studies Journal. Her work has appeared in many journals, including Comparative Studies in Society and History, IJMIS, and City and Society, among others. Um, so uh, thank you, Sara, so much for joining us today. Um, just before I, I jump into the programming, I want to thank um, Christian Clinton uh, and um, Matthew, our uh, um, events coordinator, um, for all the work that they put in um, to do the advertising and, and manage the Zoom. So um, thank you so much for that. And I will thank our Associate Director, Shana Marshall, who's going to be handling the question and answer. So Sara, first of all, I just want to say you've written a remarkable book, so rich. Um, you really uh, have have made a very sophisticated and, and complex argument that I hope we can we can break down uh, for the audience and really uh, show them how rich this book is. Why don't you just start off by telling us how you came to write this book? Um, thank you so much, Mona. Uh, I want to say, first off, thank you so much to IMS for this uh, incredible invitation um, and to um, uh, Mona uh, for taking the time to read the book uh, so thoughtfully uh, and to engage with me today. Uh, I've been following your work forever, so it's it's quite the honor to do that. Um, so yeah, how did I get to this book? Uh, great question. Um, so I, uh, you know, it, sort of like um, many other first books, this is based on uh, my dissertation. Um, and basically the way this happened is during grad school, um, I was very, very interested in question of inequality and redistribution. Um, it, the genealogy of that probably comes from um, doing uh, my undergraduate at the American University in Cairo in, in their downtown campus, where um, inequalities um, were quite stark and really stayed with me. Um, so I took all sorts of classes around political economy. And one of the things that really struck me um, was how there was a bifurcation um, of a conversation around neoliberalism. Um, whereby in critical political economy, which eventually becomes kind of my intellectual home, um, I found that there was quite the conversation about sort of, I guess one of the things that struck me was how much there was an assumption um, that there was a unidirectional kind of wealth extractive project underlying neoliberalism. Um, but not just fueling neoliberalism, but also its effects. Um, and that was a little bit, um, for me, too rigid of an assumption about how this works. And I really wanted to question that. Um, on the other hand, um, I took a lot of classes also in sort of within a political science department um, with um, uh, that in courses that were a little bit what we would call positivist uh, around kind of studying what the free market is. Um, its relationship to growth and so on. And from there, I saw some really interesting mechanisms that were being discussed about how the free market works, but was really uneasy, um, almost by the opposite, which is how little we talked about the politics underlying um, the free market and its mechanisms. Um, and so one of the things that came to me as I was doing all of this is that um, perhaps one of the reasons why these assumptions are so prevalent is because we've come to these questions from very familiar sites for the study of redistribution, uh, subsidies, uh, rent control, um, 
things like uh, uh, labor politics and so on. And I thought to myself, well, what if we come to it from less familiar sites? Would we see it differently? Um, and at the same time, I was being exposed to a fascinating literature and political geography, including your own work, um, urbanism, infrastructure studies, and so on, um, that was doing what I call kind of helping me see the political where you least expect it. And um, there kind of blew my mind. We were seeing politics and sewage networks and transoceanic shipping and all sorts of things like that. Um, and, you know, and, I, and urbanism and, and urban design really kind of sat with me and I took multiple classes around it. Um, and I figured, you know what, this is a really great place to start this inquiry um, from what I'm thinking of as a less familiar site for it. Um, and that's basically why I then turned to urban transformation in Istanbul and Cairo um, and designed this project as sort of a multi-sided ethnography in six neighborhoods um, in Istanbul and Cairo that were where you could really see the city kind of being um, opened up <laughs> almost uh, through these massive urban transformation projects that would bring in a lot of experts because I was really interested in the politics of expertise. Um, so urban planners, architects, and so on. Um, and I was also interested in funders and, and um, large kind of the, the makers of these projects to be sitting in very different positions vis-a-vis -vis what I'm calling the market. Um, and so I designed it so I was looking at projects funded by international NGOs, by corporate developers, by state agencies um, in, in each of the two cities of Istanbul and Cairo. Um, and we can, you know, and, and there's also the dimension of why Istanbul and Cairo, which I can talk about at length, but I will just say quickly that um, these are, you know, I was really interested in the layered layering of multiple um, uh, you know, the layered cities and cities where so, you know, a lot is happening, which allows us to see kind of the politics at work. Um, and Istanbul and Cairo are two of the largest metropolitan cities in the Middle East, which is where I had been trained and, and kind of, and I also had the languages for them. And so I decided, okay, let's start there and see what happens. Wonderful. Um, so I wanted to ask you, you know, one of what I got is sort of the main argument, of course, there's multi layers, but is that neoliberalization has not eroded redistributive politics, but rather displaced that struggle away from the tra traditional political arenas and onto the urban built environment. So I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you can maybe walk us through the ways in which these political struggles have seeped into the city's built environment. Absolutely. Um, I really like how you've distilled um, the argument. And I think maybe the best way to do this um, is to start out from my ethnography. Um, so I'll start with one of the, the anecdote that actually opens up um, the book and I'll read a little bit if that's okay. Um, here we go. So Hagga Samia and her ailing mother have lived in an apartment in historic Cairo that borders a 74 acre garbage dump for decades. The apartment occupies the top floor of a three-story Mamluk-style building in Darb al-Ahmar neighborhood, and for years, Hagga Semya's family could see the heaps of rubbish from the living room windows, its, put its putrid smells wafting over every time wind gusted in from the east. The building had also been unmaintained for decades, and when an earthquake shook Cairo to its core in 1992, its structure started to fracture. After living with the fear of impending collapse for half a decade, the family's fortunes took a decided turn in the late 1990s. A developmental organization based in The Hague, the Aga Khan Foundation, which I'll be talking a lot about, had taken an interest in this corner of Cairo, embarking on two urban projects in Darb al-Ahmar that would wholly transform how Hagga Samia experienced her home. Um, Initially, in 1995, the foundation embarked on a project that would excavate the garbage drum and transform it into one of central Cairo's largest green spaces, Al Azhar Park. Then in 1997, the foundation initiated a home restoration program that would eventually restore 120 buildings in Darb al-Ahmar. And Hagga Semya's home was selected for the pilot phase of the program and offered a grant. 
So I walked around um, the house with Hagga Samia and she showed me for many hours um, all of the different restoration work that um, the Aga Khan Foundation had done in her home, which was quite remarkable and a huge transformation in her life. But what was very interesting is that when we got to the bathrooms, she got a little bit, uh, her tone changed a little bit. She got a little bit nervous about, because she was about to complain about the project, although she, she didn't really want to. Um, but she told me, you know, one of the strangest things about this project is that they install, installed shared water pumps. Um, and uh, what that means is that Kagasenia could only use the water pump if her neighbors turned it off. And so she had to coordinate with her neighbors in order to use the pump. And she said, that's very strange because it made the house more inconvenient, even because before the restorations, we could control our water as we wished. Um, and so she always kind of wondered why they did that. And I filed this away as a very strange kind of oddity, right, that I would ask urban planners about. Um, and so I go and I have conversations with some of those urban planners. And one of them, uh, I ask uh, Sammy, I ask why, why this kind of design for the shared water pumps. And the way he described um, the logic behind it was fascinating. And I'll read um, his words, uh, and I quote here. Our purpose was that you learn to coordinate with your neighbors. So, for example, when we installed water pumps, we would find that in a building with six residents, each of the residents wants to install their own water pump. We would refuse such requests because if they can't resolve issues around using a water pump, then there is no sense in them restoring the house altogether. In other words, they have to talk to each other, end quote. So this blast, you know, it was mind blowing because here I was waiting for this really technical explanation. And instead, I'm hearing a super political explanation, right? We're designing community in Darb al Ahmar. And I'm just like, wow, OK, this was handed to me, right, as a political scientist. Um, and, um, and I dig deeper, and I ask, you know, why? What's community doing, right? And, and really, <clears throat> through our conversations, real estate comes up quite a bit. And it's and it, it seems to me like the Aga Khan Foundation, and then I sort of um, do many more interviews and, and start to see this pattern, that the Aga, Aga Khan Foundation and its team is really interested in intervening um, in the real estate market in Darb al -Ahmar. And what they really care about is safeguarding affordable housing in the city as one of the major goals of that project. Um, and they saw fostering community as a way to produce what I call sort of an invested, or what they also call an invested community that would um, actually not be pushed out by gentrifiers, which I'll talk about later, um, or I can talk about more. Um, but um, but what was interesting is that here we are, um, you know, from water pumps, we're getting to the way, you know, seeing projects intervene in, the, in real estate and safeguard affordable housing. Uh, which are projects and social justice agendas that we believe, you know, that critical political economy has sort of set aside as things that have been, um, all, you know, dwindling in a neoliberal moment. And here we have a lot of funding for this kind of project. And I didn't just see it in Cairo. I saw it over and over again. Um, all those protagonists uh, transforming the city, working to intervene in real estate markets. And um, I saw them doing it for a variety of political projects, safeguard affordable housing on the other hand, but also on the other hand to, um, uh, you know, uh, foreigner markets for luxury clientele. Um, and so what you're seeing um, is a variety of these projects. And what was really interesting about them is that they were all working to manipulate this thing that we call the free market. So even the people that we think are the winners of neoliberalization who would love the free market and accumulate capital are constantly working to manipulate it, distort it, and so on. And what I found is that so much of this manipulation is happening through subtle, quiet work of things like urban planning and design. And spe specifically for housing, what was happening was this creation of um, the, the notion of sort of, you know, the way to manipulate the market is really to manipulate value because the way homes are valued is at the heart 
of how you create, say, demand or supply, right? Uh, but especially demand. Um, and it's if you can engineer value in particular ways that attract particular groups and, you know, and not others, um, then you can create what I'm calling um, particularistic value. And through that bound markets for particular product uh, groups and not others. And in that way, manipulate the market. So what I'm really arguing is that if we were to really open up what we mean by the market, uh, we would find that a lot of political projects, varied political projects, are vying to manipulate how the market works in order to enable those political projects, such as safeguarding affordable housing. Um, but um, you know that your your question gets into what do I mean by seeping into the city's built environment? Well, um, if you're going to do all of that manipulation quietly through the subtle mechanisms of urban design, what that means is that you end up having um, decisions uh, around things like, you know, what sh shared water pumps or how balconies are designed or how clotheslines are designed um, or how, you know, the facades of um, buildings, their stonework, their paint colors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, all of that becomes burdened with the weight of, performing political work um, it, within the logics of the market. Um, and that's how I see kind of these things that we call um, and, and how like decisions around the city, its crevices and so on, becoming burdened by the weight of class and redistributive politics. Um, and, you know, in the book, I also try to trace now how contestations around these political projects um, repoliticize um, these projects through these very crevices as well. Um, and so a lot of that, a lot of that struggle is happening through, um, and hence the title of the book, right? Politics in the Crevices. I want to return to the question of value. And yeah. um, you kind of, you know, throughout the book, you're describing the ways that different groups came to relate to and value property. Right. Um, and you focus really on the historic core and the downtown, but you describe it as spatial material and affective transformations. And yeah. I, I really appreciated this kind of layered understanding of change that you set up. But I'm wondering if you can explain how, um, you know, how this layered understanding sets the stage for so much of, you know, what you end up finding in your research and telling us through the ethnography. Absolutely. That's a wonderful question. Um, so the first part of the book, the book is written in two parts. <clears throat> the first part, which I dubbed the making of property markets, um, is doing exactly what you're describing, right? What it's interested in is taking a long durée view of how different groups, stakeholders, protagonists, um, position themselves in the city and come to value its property um, in different ways, right? And, and become positioned um, around property, around the value of um, not just property, but um, ownership of the city itself in different ways. Um, and to really understand that, um, you know, I trace the ways in which uh, the city itself, its transformation, uh, living it, um, not just, uh, you know, in terms of everyday life, but also the meanings that are attached to these um, experiences over time through colonial, post-colonial moments, um, transform how people um, relate to the city, value it, and value their places of, you know, their homes, their places of work, um, how they navigate its streets and so on and so forth. And it's only if you understand that, um, that we can then come to talk about how in the 2000s, when all these urban transformation projects and what I'm calling neoliberal restructuring um, <clears throat> happens, um, different groups are already kind of positioned in particular ways, um, value the city and its, its property in particular ways. And through that, we can understand how these political projects are engineered um, to produce what, it, what I'm calling a you know particularistic value. Um, would you like me to go into a couple of examples of that, um, use of these kind of layers? Yeah, that would be great. I think, um... We can at least sort of illustrate, you know, uh, 
what is a little bit of an abstract notion, but I think that yeah. it, in your book, it's quite concrete. So. Absolutely. So, um, you know, in Cairo, for example, I trace, uh, I take some time to trace, for example, how the changing water um, ecologies of water in the city transform how people come to value uh, downtown or actually historic Cairo. Um, so, for example, for a long time, um, it was quite a marshy and watery terrain. Um, and, you know, the relationship between Cairo and the Nile was really important in shaping how it was, um, how, you know, er, it's uh, people kind of built up the city. Um, and especially uh, the walled city of historic Cairo, which was kind of the main urban space, um, was for a very long time pretty stable uh, because people um, needed a particular distance from the Nile's flooding. But when you see, um, you know, in the mid 1800s, you start to have pretty large infrastructural projects that are um, managing the Nile, its flooding and so on, and producing a lot more um, uh, reclaimed land that is easy to be built on. And what that creates is huge competition, basically, um, for, um, you know, a away from the historic city uh, where people start moving outside of it. Um, and a lot of the buildings that um, historic and, and and so a lot quite a bit of an exodus, uh, elite exodus from uh, historic Cairo to other areas of the city. But you also see uh, that doesn't mean that that vacates historic Cairo, but you see an interesting transformation in its demography. Um, and you see a lot of kind of uh, mi migration into it from rural areas. Um, you see its urban fabric get divided up in re really interesting ways to accommodate that. Um, and so, um, and also a drying up of a lot of the, its, its own watery terrain, uh, because now you can use underground um, water systems and so on, rather than, um, you know, lakes and, and so on for, for water. And so this also creates new spaces in historic Cairo. So really kind of understanding that gives you a sense of those demographic shifts, who is valuing historic Cairo when, and one of, you know, if you really want to touch on what meaning making um, <clears throat> looks like in that moment, um, one of the things that I want to contest through the book a little bit um, is how we talk about rural quote unquote migrants, right? Um, think of them as very temporary um, people who don't really are never urbane in particular ways and not connected to the city. Um, but in fact, many of the people who continue to be called rural migrants, possibly because of the aesthet sartorial aesthetics or um, the way they, um, you know, their dialects and so on and so forth uh, in Cairo have been in there for, you know, uh, decades, if not more than a century, right, in their families. Uh, at least through my ethnography, I saw that. And I saw also an incredible rootedness in the city. And so I want to kind of you know, think about the way in which rootedness pushes against this idea of, of migrant that we we talk about um, in a sort of almost in a way kind of waving away the rights of populations that came in through these waves to something like historic Cairo. Uh, so I'll, I'll, if it's okay, read a short quote um, that demonstrates that rootedness. But one of the people um, it, that came up in my research was um, Amel Lipton, who is actually in downtown Cairo, um, who comes from Upper Egypt and runs a coffee shop from the 50s uh, or the 60s. Um, and what's interesting is that he had built up some uh, trees or uh, what comes to be called al Naba outside of the, uh, the coffee shop where people would sit in the shade and, and it was really valued in the neighborhood. Um, and the way in which we come to see how people understood the Amaliton as rooted in downtown Cairo rather than as like an upper Egyptian uh, migrant um, comes in when we hear about his death. Um, and here is one of the quotes um, from people who related his death. And I quote, the most difficult moment I experienced in my life was in his coffee shop. It was the moment the Ma'alim died. We were preparing the tobacco coal for the shisha and it looked like something was wrong with his heart. We took him to the hospital. They told us that he'd been dead for five minutes. 
we were totally devastated. I hadn't seen it coming. And there was a takaiba with two trees that the madam had planted with his bare hands. I tell you, we buried him at 11 a.m. And by 1 p.m., the takaiba was falling apart. The takaiba, the whole thing was falling down in front of us, end quote. And what's fascinating is to see how rootedness is understood um, for someone like Amalipton as not just someone who is a migrant and can just move anywhere else in the city. And so it's that kind of um, understandings of meaning around those lived experiences that the chapters are trying to do. Um, yeah, so you see water ecologies, you see how World War II impacts rent control, you see how the earthquake and its management, um, you see how geographies of industrialization um, shape both cities, um, and, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to name you an honorary geographer. Um, <laughs> I love that. Thank you. <laughs> because your book is extremely spatial and you employ a lot of concepts from, from the discipline of geography. Obviously, uh, you know, it's, space is a big thing, but you also talk a lot about scale. Um, and in particular, you know, whether it's how you chose your your sites and 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 thinking about Cairo and Istanbul and 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 kind of community and all of these are all very scalar questions. But you also talk about the remaking of public space. Um, and a lot of it seemed to me to be talking about the rescaling of responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. both in the sense of sort of moving responsibility from community to the household or vice versa from the household to form notions of community. And then even, um, you know, towards the end, you start talking about even the nation and citizenship and sort of, um, so I'm wondering, uh, you also talk about this kind of moving again of the political contestation into these intimate and private spaces um, of the home. And so you're you're constantly kind of jumping scale is is sort of the the lingo we use in the discipline. And so I'm wondering if you might just take a minute to discuss, you know, how you think about scale and how you approach it in the book and and how it might have um, contributed to to your analysis. Thank you. That's a great question. Um... And even though scale is in the title of the book, <laughs> Politics and the Crevices, I don't actually um, take it like, um, you know, directly as as a as a discussion around what I mean by scale, because I almost assume it in how I come to the world. Um, so I like that your question is kind of pushing me to think what I actually mean um, and how I'm using it. So a couple of really kind of methodological points. Um, first is that I think of, as you're describing, right? I think of scale very dynamically. Um, so it's very important for me um, to be, a, I mean, most of this work is about being able to move from scales that we, um, especially in political science, have dealt with very rigidly as separate um, spaces. And for me, it's really important to move across scales and think about um, how they interact, how they're layered, um, you know, um, and also non-linearly, not sort of from particular, you know, uh, whatever nation to local or global to local, um, but instead constantly, I think, disrupting some of those hierarchies. Um, but what's more important to me um, is thinking about those interactions and that dynamism in terms of what it produces politically. Um, so thinking about our own conceptualization of scale um, and how it's integrated into political, uh, into poli you know, into political dynamics um, um, productively, right? Um, and how the interactions between those scales produce something. Um, in terms of power, in terms of politics. Um, and so so given those methodological kind of place or, or kind of starting points, um, I guess in terms of um, what I'm trying to do with the book, um, I, I, I think it's interesting that you um, see it, uh, see this thing around the rescaling of responsibility 
um, which is absolutely part of what I'm seeing. Um, but it's also important to me that we place that discourse around responsibility and its rescaling within the larger argument I'm saying, which is the contestation over responsibility as well. So what I'm most interested in um, is this latter part of, of your question, right? the rescaling of um, political contestation um, to the spaces of, uh, you know, to these crevices. Um, so um, what I was really hoping to do in the book is think about how tracing where um, and through which kind of scalar layers, um, interactions and so on, um, where we can locate the political differently. And that gets at like how I got to this book, right? Going to the less familiar sites. Well, part of it was to think about scale creatively, right? How it mediate politic, mediates politics in important ways. Um, and, and through that then um, how politics, it's not just that the argument is not just that we've rescaled politics, but the next level of thinking is what does that mean? So what does the polity actually look like? Once rescaled, what does political contestation coming from the crevices look like? Um, and so um, I'm interested, you know, I, and I make arguments about how, you know, once once the, the city's built environment, once these struggles are seeping through the city's built environment, um, these then become struggles that are much more difficult to recuperate. They're fractured. Um, they're sitting, you know, we're having some really heavy politics around class, around identity, play out or, you know, through the space of a balcony or a, a water pump and so on. And, and that kind of burdening and that kind of rescaling um, changes, you know, the, the way in which people then relate to each other politically or how you can rec recuperate or negotiate some really heavy um, struggles um, and, and creates what I'm calling sort of this festering, um, suspicious, uh, you know, politics allows for more conspiracy theory and so on. Um, and I even make sort of a jump at the end of the book, uh, which I, I think you're gesturing to with the whole thing about um, nation and citizenship, um, that the more you do that, the more you open up um, the possibilities for things like, uh, you know, conspiracy theory, et cetera. And from there, the other ring that is essential to something like a populist politics. Um, but we can sort we're of gonna just, go there, I think. We're gonna go there maybe <laughs> at some point. So I'll I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> the conclusion was so usually when you get to the conclusion, you're just like, okay, I'm gonna trot along here. And then you pop down these really new <laughs> ideas. And I was like, oh no, you can't stop there. What do you mean the book is over? So I will ask you about that because okay. I were interested in what you had to say about populism and neuro neoliberalism. Um, but I want to go back to sort of maybe thinking through uh, some of the examples. So um, like the one you shared about the water pumps, you have this other example where you talk about how um, Aga Khan uh, in Darb al-Ahmar is interested in having um, residents make a financial contribution like to, you know, some percentage um, of the of the renovations, right? Um, and so you provide this amazing discussion of how uh, something that you would expect architects and urban planners to want very precise, and they have the mechanisms to say, okay, you own, you know, 0.5%, so you're going to, that's how much you're going to pay. But you talk us through this sort of example of how the precision in the division of shares is actually not the priority. Uh, in fact, it's purposefully reduced in order to, again, force this sense of community that you shared with the water pump um, amongst the residents. So <laughs> I'm reading this and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, how did they even justify this? How does the Aga Khan Foundation you know, defend this decision uh, to use sort of less accurate information than they actually have? And what do you think are kind of, what are the assumptions that are that are underscoring this decision and I think that plays into actually several of your of your uh, of your examples um, in terms of uh, what they're trying to, you know, that you call social engineering or kind of um, instilling particular values in the in the residents. Yeah, I mean, uh, this example kind of blew me away when I like it took me a while to really register 
how, you know, when I was talking to the urban planner who was describing this, right, how you would have a home, you know, it's, let's say it's two, this, this floor is two meters or two meters squared or whatever. Um, wait, let's just say it's two units. Let's go with that, right? Um, and you have three houses and one of them is 0.4, one of them is 0.65, and one of them is 0.95, I guess, or is it? Yeah, I think 0.95. Um, what's interesting is here, you're gonna have one pay instead of 0 0.4, 0 0.5. Another one's gonna pay instead of 0 0.65, 0 0.5. And then instead of 0 0.95, one. Um, and so here you have a house in the middle that benefits quite a bit. I mean, they're they they took off 0.15 of their unit from their share, their financial share, um, in this 30 percent that they're all supposed to pay uh, towards restorations, um, and it and it blew me away because I asked the urban planner several times, wait, so why why like isn't it very easy to do the math? Like I can imagine you can just calculate 0.65 times whatever number 5,000 and you'll get it right. Um, and he was like, yeah, it sounds easy to you, but what I really wanted to do is to get these people to talk to each other, to negotiate. Um, they also didn't accept any applications. If your building, let's say has six people, if five of them say yes, and one of them says no to the restorations, you don't get any money and you don't get the restoration because you have to do the work as a building to apply together. And so over and over again, I keep hearing this thing about, need people to talk to each other and they need to negotiate they have to build a community um as you're saying and and it and it was quite stark and how much this was coming up um and i think the way they i mean they don't they they didn't actually defend it too much um which is i think interesting um to the people so when you talk to people they really do marvel there's a lot of question marks around how the Aga Khan made decisions so especially decisions around which houses got the funding and others who didn't there was so much ire and like frustration around because they only at the end of the day restored 120 buildings uh when you have thousands um you know something like 5,000 or something one of the urban planners told me um that they could have restored in that neighborhood um, and they had, by extension, at least hundreds, if not more, you know, thousands of applications um, for this basically free money to restore your houses. Um, and yet there's all this high level thinking about, you know, we're going to use, you know, get these these buildings to think of themselves as community, as belonging to something together. And then they it will almost be sort of a, a snowball effect of getting others around them to feel invested in the neighborhood. And maybe people will, you know, want to be, uh, have nice houses like their neighbors. So they'll start to invest in their own and then they'll start to invest in public spaces, which was a big part of what they wanted to do is to get people to own not just their homes, but the neighborhood. Um, and I see that as a way of engineering kind of almost boundaries around the neighborhood so that it's residents are the ones who not just um, uh, kind of um, stay in their homes, but also service the neighborhood so that outsiders wouldn't feel welcome in this space, wouldn't feel like they would be serviced unless they were part of the community. Um, and I saw that as community playing this kind of work of boundary setting, um, because a lot of the time when we talk about community, we talk about trust. Um, and actually what I saw was a lot of boundary setting rather than trust making, which which I thought was interesting. Um, but I think I'm straying for your, from your question quite a bit. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, and, and what was interesting to me is that when you interviewed different urban planners, they also had very different notions of what community is, even though they sat on the same team. And some of them actually didn't believe at all that there was any hope that people in Darbul Ahmar would feel like they were connected as a community, regardless of what societal engineering you did. Um, and others felt like they already had all these networks and all they were doing was kind of um, just, you know, building on what's there. 
um, whereas others were very hopeful, like Sammy, for example, who's this urban planner that uses the language of community quite a bit. Um, he was pretty sure that you're you're engineering something um, not completely from scratch, but almost, and that you could do that. So there also the variety there, the the variation there was quite interesting. Um, I want to move us maybe towards the second part of the book, um, where you uh, talk about how tourism has a very complicated relationship with this redistributive agenda. Mm -hmm. And you kind of walk us through like the usual story, the way it goes is like, you know, the displacement that that tourists wouldn't, the desire, desirability mm -hmm. of a neighborhood would then, you know, allow for displacement. But instead, you know, you 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 use this notion of visual topographies to talk about how the various tourist routes and the tourist gaze actually work to demarcate boundaries, as you were talking about, and um, that in reconstituting the boundary between public and private, that there was a a new form of gendered asymmetry or a reinforcement of gendered asymmetries. And so, I thought this was really interesting. Um, and it's the really the chapter five where you have a gendered analysis. Um, and so I was wondering if you could just talk us through the visual topographies, the gendered asymmetries, and this reworking of, of private and public. Absolutely. Um, I mean, there's a lot, um, I, there, there are many dimensions to this argument. I'll focus just on the gender part. Um, but before I do so, I mean, I'll say the chapter does also think about how these tourist routes um, shape public and private in terms of, you know, going back to this question of responsibility for infrastructure. And um, it's really interesting how infrastructure and public infrastructure is follows the tourist um, and their roots um, versus other different logics that you could have had to kind of structure what, what public infrastructure looks like. Um, and also draws very rigid boundaries between what um, private citizens are responsible for, what the state is responsible for around the presence of tourists in neighborhoods, which I thought was, which I found kind of really interesting. Um, but this question of gaze, um, so the, the chapter follows the ways in which um, tourism shapes, um, you know, the expectation of tourists shapes where um, different projects go, even the funding for um, especially the facades of buildings in particular places um, and the restoration and so on. Um, but um, when I was thinking about um, gender, and this, as you're saying, only comes up in chapter five, mostly because I'm very anxious around um, making too many kind of statements around how um, gender plays out in the city. Um, but this was quite glaring to me, um, the ways in which um, the movement of uh, tourists and their gaze uh, around the city really, really transforms how um, especially women uh, navigate these neighborhoods. Um, so one of the things I was thinking about was how um, tourists uh, and their use of cameras and photographs and so on um, have a very different understanding of the gaze um, than say people living in a lot of these neighborhoods. So you would see um, women um, sitting very comfortably in a lot of the sort of inside or, you know, the, the more the streets become uh, uh, move in inwards in the neighborhood, the more you see activity and social activity and so on. And you see men and women negotiating these spaces, um, women who would be, say, less um, comfortable. I mean, they sit outside of their home in ways that they would only sit uh, in clothes or in, um, you know, doing activities that they would normally um, do in the home, but they see the street as an extension of their home. Um, and I saw ways in which um, sort of there were clear unspoken norms around how um, these different genders, uh, um, how people gaze um, uh, uh, and the sort of softer gaze uh, uh, in the neighborhood to allow women that kind of space and comfort, and especially say in balconies and so on. Um, but of course, once I trace how once tourists come in, you get a, a lot more rigid understanding of what is public and private and how the gaze should operate um, as kind of 
you know, open uh, space everywhere, the gaze can go everywhere, um, and how that then moves women, um, you know, away from that comfortable space, um, or at least to renegotiate how they use these spaces. Um, what um, some of, of the women I interviewed called Belirli Mekanlar in Turkey, or the well-known places that where they knew how to navigate, um, become less and less well-known, right? Because they become kind of open um, to this tourist gaze. But what was interesting is also that I talked to a few people who really was hap were happy about this, um, because you know the the opening up of the space also brought with it anonymity um, that some, especially of the younger women that I spoke to, uh, wanted a lot more anonymity and kind of um, the space to, to be a lot less kind of surveilled almost um, in the neighborhood. And so I don't know that it's necessarily unidirectional, but it does transform how women uh, especially uh, navigated those spaces. But thanks for the question. Um. So I definitely want to make sure we have enough time for questions. I have a ton of questions, so I'm going to skip actually a few and and move to what hopefully will be a last question, and then we'll allow the audience. And then if I have time, I'll ask I'll ask some other questions. Um, but I wanted to go back to kind of your conclusion. Um, and uh, so I know that your research was mostly completed before the revolution and the counter revolution, and um, so you know. I, I I totally don't expect you to have traced this to the present moment, but I was struck by the sort of absence of discussion about the existing political order, you know, given you're talking about Turkey and and Egypt um, and and the, that these are places of, you know, intense political contestation. Uh, so I'm but where the formal political space has basically been shut down in a lot of ways, right? Um, so how do you think that that um, shutting down of, of political space then further might, might further entrench these political contestations precisely into these private spaces and these more micro scales that you're talking about? And I, you know, I, in a sense, I'm also wanting to get you to talk a little bit more about um, the relationship between populism and neoliberalism um, and I just, I actually do want to read, uh, this very short paragraph that you have in the conclusion where you say the displacement of political struggle, especially, but not exclusively class politics onto the unfamiliar sites, such as contestations over the city's intimate, private and invisible crevices creates the festering fractured and conspiratorial political climate upon which populism thrives. Um, dislocating a political battle as crucial as the battle for housing onto contestations over the intricate architectural design of the built environment transforms them into confusing, obscure, fragmented micro battles that are difficult to see as shared struggles and impossible to harness and negotiate overtly as a polity. I loved this. I was so interested. I was like, yes, where are you going with this? Um, and as I mentioned, then it kind of ends. So I wanted to take the opportunity, and since I have you here, um, to ask you if you could expand upon this a bit and sort of, you know, show us where you're going and maybe what you were thinking about um, the basically the transformation of the political environment. Absolutely. Um, there's a lot in this question. Um, the let me just start from the quote that you read uh, and then maybe circle back to some of um, the earlier the first half of the question. Um, so yeah, so the idea I was, I guess, um, in my head, I had, you know, as I was publishing articles from the project and so on, I got several, um, pu some pushback to say, you know, why should we care about neoliberalism? We're in a post neoliberal moment, like none of this, you know, is relevant anymore. Um, and to me, that like, was so shocking as a question, because, you know, in my head, like, this is huge. This is how, you know, restructured entire polities um, over the last two, three decades. Um, and and then it it struck me that, you know, what we're what what is I think is really important for us to understand, which I think some people are missing, is that it's not one, you know, system and then another system that are like 
you know, disconnected from each other. Uh, but in fact, what we're seeing and almost what we're calling post neoliberal is neoliberal politics. Um, it's just we haven't taken the time to really sit with what something like um, the marketization of politics, which is really how I think about neoliberalism. And I, I take, I build on uh, um, the insights that Chalish Khan and Kurai Chalish Khan and Michelle Kalon have these beautiful two articles um, where they describe this idea of the marketization of um, marketization as kind of neoliberalization, which I found very helpful because it's very specific. Um, and really to understand, I mean, this project is all about locating the political um, in a neoliberal moment. And if we're going to think of, um, we can't really call it post neoliberal, if it is neoliberal, because this is, you know, this is what neoliberalism produces. This is the very politics that is the product of marketization of politics. We've, I think we came to accept too much that neoliberalism actually succeeds in depoliticizing the political. Um, and, and what I'm arguing is no, it, what it's doing is just displacing it. And this is then what ends up what ends up happening is that you produce this, you know, politics in the crevices, hard to recuperate, hard to con festering, conspiratorial. And, uh, and then it's not too surprising that then platforms that are populist and othering and that take advantage of that kind of festering politics become quite um, uh, triumphant, actually in both Egypt and Turkey, uh, as my research is winding up. So um, to me, that linkage, it's not just a linkage, but it's that is the politics um, that that we've all kind of came to. I, I think our problem was that we had accepted this notion of the depoliticization of neoliberalism too much. Um, and I think one of the things um, you say, there's a, you know, there's quite a bit of political contestation happening um, in Istanbul and Kar in fact, it was happening while I was doing the research. So it's not that, you know, I hadn't seen it um, around Gezi, around Tahrir and so on and so forth. Um, uh, but it, it was interesting to me how one, so a lot of that, and I talk a little bit about this notion of mediated citizenship that a lot of what was happening in the 2000s, um, you know, uh, was, uh, and that kind of dwindling space for, for class struggle and so on, it wasn't just about authoritarianism. And that's one of the things that is important to me um, because so much of what we write in the middle, about the Middle East is about authoritarianism. But what I'm describing here is about marketization specifically and the dwindling space for class struggle specifically. Um, and that's not just about uh, authoritarianism and censorship. This is about all sorts of systems that accepted marketization as a, as a neo, and, and the neo, as neoliberal restructuring. And so I see it as moving beyond kind of these spaces for, um, that are just, you know, that the, the kind of the exceptional space of authoritarian, Middle Eastern authoritarianism is really what I want to work against um, as, as as seeing this argument kind of traveling to other places as well. I hope that makes sense. That's great. Um, I want to give the audience an opportunity to ask questions, but I don't see any in the Q&A. Um, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A box, which is at the bottom um, of the screen, and you should be able to um, post questions there. In the meantime, uh, since I get to have you longer, <laughs> I want to go back to um, sort of politics again. I, so in particular, uh, I think I... I've mentioned to you, like, I, I'm really interested in the ways in which you are discussing how, you know, you expected to kind of have technical responses a lot of times. And instead of a technical solution or a technical explanation, it ended up being political. Um, so, you know, my own uh, current project is is about how a technical solution, poverty mapping, has is actually highly politicized. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, how you came to, because 
sorry, to just go back a little bit, like I know you were reading the same literature, right? About mm -hmm. rendering calculable and, you know, the and especially in Egypt, uh, on the Egypt side, like all so much literature on development practice and, you know, experts. And you said, I'm interested in experts and expertise. And so uh, we're in that literature, right? And then you get to your field work and everything is political, right? And there pops up in places, like I know you set out to do uh, to look for for politics, you know, in 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 the what you said un, unusual sites, but then it emerges also, I think, in surprising ways that I that I don't think you were expecting. So I just kind of wanted to circle back and ask you um, about, you know, the politicized nature. Basically, if we could think of urban planning as develop as a form of development solution how you saw politicization show up in places that you you really didn't expect. Absolutely. I mean, um, <laughs> you're right. I mean, I thought I would, I, I knew I was coming into this um, thinking about politics, right? And looking for the political where you least expect it. Um, so that was definitely there. Um, but you're right. We were reading the same literature. Um, I was really interested i mean i i wanted i wanted architects to get technical right every time they tried to be like oh but you're not really trained in this would you understand it? i was like no just try me you know keep going with your technical explanations um and really get into the architectural nitty-gritty uh i'm really curious uh about this and then i'll 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 worry about the politics right um but what was interesting is that when we keep going into the technical, it, it you know the political jumped in my face a little bit less subtly than I expected, right? Um, as you're seeing in in some of uh, in a lot of these um, chapters, right? And 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 how these projects worked out. Um, so so it made me kind of sit and rethink, right? Like, was there, you know, one of the things I wondered is whether we had um you know had the field become so uh i guess expectant um that what neoliberalism is the space where the technical gets so much authority and so we you know really kind of focus so much on the technical and didn't see the political that was right in front of us um that was one of the questions that like came to me i i wondered if really part of it is a blind spot um, in in how we uh, we've conceptualized the role of the technical in a neoliberal moment, um, almost accepting again this kind of work of depoliticization a little bit too much. Like we we accepted it so much we didn't see some of the things that and I actually got asked quite a bit um, when I would talk say in architectural circles and so on about societal engineering. They would be like, "Are we even allowed to use that?" you know, uh, that kind of language after the modernist project, right? Everyone was like, well, modernism was the end of societal engineering. We all know it failed and people moved on. And I'm like, you'd be surprised that people are <laughs> moved on, right? Like I'm seeing it pretty starkly. Um, and so really the field spoke back um, in ways that made my life easier because I, you know, I was looking for the political. <laughs> so, um, but I think part of it might have been also um, the lens, right? Being trained, um, to think about power and politics in particular ways makes it um, more likely that you would see, um, I think, and like take, give the space to projects and take seriously the projects when they talk about societal engineering and, and so on. I think part of it is also that people um, ask me why I was taking seriously things that, you know, we would consider naive, such as a social justice agenda or, you um, you know, thinking about some of these um, architects as what I call self-reflexive architects and, and planners who are really invested in these political projects that I think are actually at work. Um, and, and my argument was, you know, we got to give space to this because it's powerful. It brings money. It, it's doing something. Um, even if we know that it is working within a system that is in itself problematic, you know, not necessarily geared around social justice agendas, but giving that space allows us to see something else, I think, um, which which we hadn't done, I think, enough of. So 
I have more questions, but uh, the associate director, Shana Marshall, has a great question. So I'm going to. Oh, excellent. I'm going to. I'm going to. Um, actually, Shana, why don't, do you want to go ahead and um, ask your question directly since you can unmute yourself? <laughs> yeah, sure. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for this uh, really excellent talk. Um, so, um, and I'm sure it's an excellent book. I'm super excited to read it. Um, so, a lot of the stories that you tell. Um, parallel this other shift or are probably part of the same sort of agglomeration of shifts that has occurred under neoliberalism in which we now signal or enact our politics and our class position through our consumption habits, right? Mm -hmm. And our design choices mm -hmm. rather than through our public political activities, which is of course a goal of neoliberalism, right, to subsume our political activity and replace it with these sort of performative consumption practices. So is the relocation of political activity into these micro spaces, do you think it's displacing some public political struggles that might take might have taken place otherwise by keeping it sort of limited to this micro level? Or do you think it's creating a new space for those struggles to sort of punch through um, and aggregate into bigger political projects that uh, the community would sort of coalesce around. Um, I guess asking you to sort of predict what you think the future of these sorts of struggles are going to look like. No, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, consumption is the flip side of this, right? Um, this kind of thinking about how political projects are you know, not just enacted through things like these development uh, projects or even just um, corporate um, real estate projects, et cetera, but also through consumption and lifestyle. And um, I mean, so there there are two, two ways to read the messaging of the book. Um, and I'm open to people reading them together, right? Um, because I think the world is messy and they are kind of being produced together, which is uh, one is, yes, the displacement. I mean, yes, the argument is ultimately that um, the displacement of politics onto these micro practices, such as consumption um, practices, um, also kind of in the same way um, as we're seeing, right? So I think of like um, the displacement upon urban design and, and, and so on as one realm of it, but cultural practices, consumption practices writ large, absolutely. Um, do I think that then um, can, you know, agglomerate into different kinds of political projects and maybe more hopeful than just um, <laughs> this kind of notion of a festering uh, politics? I actually do. Um, so part of, you know, the, the part about citizenship and the conclusion um, is a little bit more hopeful than maybe I I like articulate it as, uh, which is to say one of the things that, you know, recuperating uh, other political projects within the machinery of what we're calling the market, right? Um, so, you know, still um, sort of seeing uh, political projects that social justice agenda, so on, still playing out in a neoliberal moment and not completely kind of um, swallowed up by uh, a dispossessive uh, extractive machine means that these political projects are alive and well, and there are ways in which um, they make it from these kind of crevices to coalesce into something powerful. And I think that's actually at the heart of what happened with Gezi. Gezi uh, Park in, in Istanbul, and I wrote about this um, uh, when it happened. Um, you know, it, it there had been a lot of political activism displaced from other places onto activism around the city, around trees, around, um, you know, how neighborhoods um, were being organized. And uh, and I think really people understanding their citizenship and what how it was being um negotiated how it was being, um, how spaces for class struggles were dwindling through their interaction with the city 
um, did actually coalesce into something really interesting. So that when what we saw as, um, you know, a heavy uh, um, uh, militarization of the space and securitization of the space, people didn't just react to the fact that it was a big police force, but it was about the fact that so much of this activism had been coming through um, uh, the, the you know, negotiating the built environment because of how people saw it as a space for the displacement of that politics. Um, so I do think that there's also a, you know, a hopeful space um, for thinking about, you know, recuperating political projects and saying that they have been displaced in this way um, isn't just, um, <laughs> you know, a, a negative story. Uh, I think both are, are our intention with one another in really interesting ways. Thank you for <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Thanks. So I don't see um I don't see more questions. I'm gonna ask you one more question and then I'll I'll let you go. Uh if we've taken a lot of your time. But um this is sort of just a question about um, your conclusions. So do you think that the displacement of the political into the crevices, um, as you've named it, is something unique to Cairo and Istanbul, or can we see this kind of rescaling of political contestation happening in other cities around the globe? It's a great question. Um, and I'm happy to uh, happily leading, I think, because I absolutely think it's it's um generalizable. Um what I would say is really the the way I thought of Istanbul and Cairo when I was approaching them. I was thinking of them as cities that had gone through this process, and I think I already kind of mentioned this a little bit, through this process of marketization. Um, and I think it's a process that we are seeing, um, of course, in very textured ways, but all over the globe, right? Um, and I think that um, if we are to take the marketization of politics seriously, um, it would be, um, you know, I, I think that marketization of politics sits with the uh, display, this kind of displacement of politics. Um, I, I would argue you can see it all over the world, right? Um, even, you know, you know, I talk to people in Philly and they're seeing some of the same dynamics I'm seeing. And I talk to people in Sao Paulo, right? So it's not... Um, even specific to global south, global north. Um, of course, how it materializes will look very different. And that's why it's so important to think about um, contextualizing things like value um, the way that I do if we're thinking about value is so crucial to how politics um, uh, manifests um, in, in this space. So, um, so again, there's a way in which you can sort of meet, understand the mediation of how this politics will appear, but this notion of its displacement, I think is is quite um, generalizable in that sense, yeah. Great. Um, Sara, thank you so much for your time and for your eloquent uh, explanation of your book and congratulations on writing um, a really wonderful um, piece of work. I want to invite our audience to come to our next event, which is Elastic Empire with Lisa Bongalia and um, Alana Feldman in conversation with Lisa. And that's February 29th at 3 p.m. That'll be hybrid um, as well as in person at GW in the Elliott School Room 505. And then uh, in March, we have Black Intifada, which is the roots of Black and Palestinian solidarity movements with Nadia Al Ahmed. Um, and that is co-sponsored uh, with Howard University and will be held on their campus. Uh, that's March 20th at 1 p.m. So I um, hope you'll join us. And thank you again, Sara, so much for um, being in conversation with me today. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you so much, Mona, and for such fabulous questions. It was really wonderful to think with them. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you.